Hi, I'm Michael Tartar with Solutions IQ. We're here at Agile 2015, uh, just outside of beautiful downtown Washington, D.C. I'm with Ken Rubin from Innolutions. And uh, Michael, thanks for having me. Glad you're here. Uh, you're doing a talk on, what, Wednesday afternoon? Wednesday afternoon, yes, 2 o'clock. What's it about? Uh, the title is called Agile Through the Value Chain. And the, the thesis behind it is that organizations historically bring Agile into their development organization first and often have a tendency to stop at that point. And what about all the other organizations that are around it? You think about the, your, de, your deployment downstream, sales, marketing, partnerships, legal, finance. What about all those other groups? And the idea here is that you have to adopt Agile throughout the value chain if you want to realize the full benefits. So the talk on Wednesday is to focus on what these other groups ought to be doing and how they can best coordinate with the development team that's already starting to do Agile. So it just occurred to me listening to you, what's so special about IT that the way they do things is the way the rest of the company should adopt it? Good point. So if you're in one of those other groups, the first thought would be, fine, you guys over there, if, I, if Agile works well for how you're doing your work, you should do it. The problem is that Agile principles tend to pervade the entire organization. And so this may be my bias, and I'll fully admit it, that I actually believe that an enterprise as a whole that is based on core Agile principles will likely see the benefits overall of doing things in a more Agile-like way. And to be truthful, I mean, which organization wouldn't want to be more Agile, more flexible, more resilient, more anti-fragile at times? And so it's a bias that I have that believes that if the entire organization is Agile, they'll see the long-term benefits. It just simply is a starting point of development. But, you know, of course, there could be organizations that don't agree. They believe that the way they've been doing things is quite fine for their marketplace, and I won't argue with them. But if they're believing that Agile is going to be helpful to the bottom line of the company, right? Saying that their development organization is Agile, if I ever have an executive say, my development team is extremely Agile, my first question would likely be, what kind of benefits are you seeing from that? Mm -hmm. Are you actually seeing business benefits? Do you see the impetus for trying an Agile approach coming from within development organizations or from outside that organization to save money, to be more efficient? Where does the spark get, get struck? So uh, I guess it can go both ways. A lot of times it does happen bottom up, right? So development might start first and then it spreads out. On other occasions, I've been in companies where the CEO brought me in and said, we want to move over to Agile. Now, now, typically that tends to be mid-sized and smaller companies. Right. right? I, I don't get called up by the CEO of a Fortune 10 company saying, we want Agile to be done throughout the company. And quite honestly, even when I do Agile at companies like, that are Fortune 10 or Fortune 100, they're a hybrid organization. Some parts are Agile, other parts aren't. And it'd be unrealistic of me to assume that initially they're going to move the entire organization over to doing Agile. My hope is that over time, as Agile's tentacles sort of reach out and touch other parts of the organization, that those parts will see the benefits of collaborating in a more uniform fashion with the other teams, right? As opposed to this very disconnected fashion. That's my hope. But in smaller and mid-sized companies, you could see it come in at a high level. Usually in the larger companies, it's going bottom up at that point. So it occurs to me that when's the last time you saw a CIO get promoted to CEO? Because IT is this thing that costs us money and is late, uh, yet we're talking about agility spreading out through the entire organization. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a collision with other improvement efforts coming from outside of development and colliding with this Agile approach? So there's two interesting points in there. First, the idea that IT development is a cost center, right? And so, and I believe that's true. I think in a lot of companies, it's exactly how it's viewed. I'd like to suggest to them that they could see more value out of the organization, out of the development organization, if they took a slightly different perspective on that that it's a value generating organization. Yes, it has costs, right? Every organization has costs to run it, mm -hmm. but it generates real value in, in an immeasurable way, in a value that can really help the bottom line of the company. So I'd like that to be the starting point. In terms of the, the collision aspect and where other issues are going on, uh, probably the largest one that I run into with some frequency is a lack of an appetite for restructuring. They've already taken on some other initiative any number of things. Right. That initiative has caused them to do a restructuring of their teams. So if you show up and say, you'd be better served from an Agile perspective, meaning you'd be more effective at applying Agile, if you would restructure in the following way, there are times a lack of appetite to want to do that. Oh, another one of those. Yeah, no, we're not going to be doing any team restructuring at this point. We just finished one of those that was two years. It was like birthing elephants. Don't ever want to do that again.
So I, I do see that kind of collision. You know, occasionally I, I've seen Agile be adopted coincident with other things, like uh, some companies were wanting to be CMMI level three. Mm -hmm. And the big concern was, are these two going to collide? Are they somewhat sort of perpendicular to each other? And the answer was that, look, you'll probably end up doing a bit more documentation in your Agile development than if you weren't doing CMMI level three, but I've seen it work enough times that I'm not concerned by that. So I think it can coexist with some of these others, but at some point I'd like to see Agile start to pervade these enterprises. And that's really what I'm going to focus on on Wednesdays. Where and offer up ideas and suggestions for how I've seen other companies do it. Way back I seem to remember uh, Ken Schwaber claiming that if you did Scrum you were CMI level something compliant by its very nature. Do you remember that? I recall some comment back then. It was probably CMI level three. That's uh, what I thought. But yeah, I, you know, look, if people think that you know, having a defined process under continuous process improvement sounds like an interesting thing to do. The, in, the part for me is that when you're trying to put a process under statistical process control, you assume a certain predictability in the process, which usually means a certain predictability in the output you're trying to generate, which makes sense in the manufacturing domain. But that's not what we do in product development. We don't replicate the same result over and over. If we did, that would be wasting our money. Yeah. Right? We, we generate the recipes for products. We don't manufacture products. So you really need a process that can adapt to the nature of what you're trying to build. So I, I do believe we ought to have good control over our process and, and refine our techniques down. But you know, whether or not we have to be CMMI level five to do that or not is a different story. So we have the advantage of recording this before your talk. So there's a good chance folks will be watching this saying, hey, wait a minute, what Ken's saying sounds interesting. If they came to your talk, what's, it, what's your intent that, uh, for what they walk out of your talk with? What will they be thinking about and chatting about with the person they walk out with? Uh, I think it's the right way to formulate that question because my hope is that initially that I get the aha. Oh yeah, that's, that's what's going on in my organization. I, I see that problem as well. But I don't want to just talk about the problem. I want to talk about what other companies are doing to address the problem. So, for example, I, I spend every week or nearly every week with one or two different companies somewhere around the world. So I get to see a lot of what's working and what isn't working. And so when I provide examples in the presentation on Wednesday, for example, I was dragged into a meeting in Houston a few months ago. And it was actually quite exciting to me. It was uh, with the CFO about how are we going to handle OPEX and CAPEX in, in a world where we're doing agile development. Hey, we're used to doing waterfall development. I know exactly how to handle that, right? The FASB standards are written uh -huh, in a way right. that tell me exactly, once we pr have proof that this is a good idea and we have management sign off, I can start capitalizing. We're doing agile now and the default is we're going to expense everything. Well, uh, that, that could be a very costly mistake in terms of taxes. Mm -hmm. So I had a good conversation with their CFO with a discussion on how would you go about doing this in a, in a world where you're doing agile development and you're not doing phase-based, stage-gate, sequential development, like a waterfall-style approach. So Wednesday is really a series of these activities where we'll talk about, in that example, would be how to deal with the finance group. What about HR? Is the, do the folks in HR have to be agile? What should they be looking to do? How would they do their job differently, given that they know they have to help staff in an organization that's going to be using agile? What about marketing? What about sales? What about partners? Our legal folks want to do fixed price, fixed date, Right. Right, fixed scope contracts, well, that's a problem for us right? in trying to do agile development. How could we work with the legal folks in order to set up contracts in an agile-like way? Mm -hmm. So my intent is to walk through the organization, and given 75 minutes, I won't be able to walk through it all. That would be a full day discussion. But I'm going to pick a number of examples and illustrate where the problem is and what I've seen other companies do to address those problems. So my, the takeaway that I hope for is that when people go back to their job, they can say, I think I can go over to marketing now and better explain to them why I can't give them the exact set of features on the date they're going to get it, nine months ahead of time, and have them go start their marketing programs. But if they partner with me in this type of fashion, they'll end up getting the information that they really need when they need it, and they'll still be able to execute on their marketing strategy, and yet it gives us the flexibility to maneuver in an agile-like way. Right. So how do we bring harmony to the situation as opposed to a large amount of discord, which is currently in many organizations? Now, you just named a lot of different parts of a, of a typical organization, and we've seen that lots of people start in the development organization. But if, if you are talking to the CEO and they're saying, hey, we want to make a difference to our organization, okay, it's a given. You're going to try to see what you can do in development. Mm -hmm. In the experiences you've had, where have you recommended starting next? So if I could change one thing immediately with senior management, 
and it's going to be related to development, but above the level of the individual teams themselves, it would be portfolio management. It would be my number one thing I would go after. Mm -hmm. the, the fact that most organizations tend to favor more traditional forms of portfolio management, whereas I advocate more agile portfolio management. So I actually talk about 11 different strategies that they can use to do portfolio management in an agile-like way. Otherwise, we get this large disconnect. Oh, teams go, have, go off and be agile, but we, at the senior management level, we're still going to operate in the way that we've always done in the past, which will very likely compromise those teams from day one. Okay. I mean, examples of that are the obvious. Uh, senior management elects to work on too many different initiatives, too many projects at the same time, so they essentially push too much demand into the system. They overload the whip limits of the teams. Now every team's trying to work on so many different things at the same time, everything slows down. Mm -hmm. right? We now have these large batches where people are overburdened, and at the end of the day, people are wondering why nothing can get done. Right. It's like, oh, these teams must be bad at doing Agile because if they were better, things would happen quicker. And the reality is, now the teams actually are trying to do the best job that they can. The problem is that the senior management team has released too much work into the teams at one time, and now they're overburdened. So if they could apply discipline at that level, they would make development downstream so much more smooth. But that's just one aspect. That would be one of the first things I would do. Then I'd want to sit down with marketing and sales. When sales walks in the door and says, I just sold a, a contract with a client, and here's the date you have to deliver it, and here's a set of features, and here's how much they're going to pay, and that's not based on anything, any type of reality other than that's what the customer asked for, again, our teams have already been compromised. When we force our partners to write contracts with us where it's, give me a fixed price bid on this, we now force us into trying to come up with all the requirements up front. You can just start seeing the disconnects and if all these different parts are trying to locally optimize within a company, and we don't really have optimization across the whole to get good, fast, flexible flow across the whole system, the thing will break down. So in your example, you, development, then portfolio management, then mm -hmm. maybe marketing, who's next? I'd be talking with the, the folks over in HR, the sales team, the legal team, because the legal team's touching this in a number of ways. There's the obvious ways that they're writing contracts, but maybe we could help them better write agile subcontracts. But even more than that, I've worked on projects before where legal, you could argue, should have been a member of the scrum team. Yeah. I mean, think about it. Here we are, we're working on a medical system, and we pop up a dialog box. That dialog box has to have text in it. And the people who are going to provide the text with the legal team because it's, it matters at that point. Sure. So what do I have to do? Well, I go over to legal and I say I need this tax, and like, I'll get in queue and that'll be six weeks. Impediment. Like, right, I'm trying to get this done in this sprint, but now you're telling me six weeks. Well, there's a lot of people making those requests. Right. So in, in the presentation, I'm going to talk about what happens when you have these, in a sense, like specialist organizations, legal being a good example of that. You know, how do they engage? Right. Should they be members of scrum teams? Should they be consultants to scrum teams? Should they act as a legal component team to whom we then outsource work, get into their queue? There are trade-offs in all those different scenarios. Yeah. But every organization is going to look at these kind of specialist groups, go, well, I don't know that I'm going to put a lawyer on every team, so tell me about other options. Mm -hmm. Maybe we don't have enough lawyers to right. go on every team. So I want to talk through different strategies I've seen companies do, and I'll use lawyers as an example because I've dealt with them in that context. So. Each of these different groups has the ability to use Agile potentially within the work that their own group does. But by basing themselves on core Agile principles, they can better interact with the other groups to get a more harmonious flow through the right. system. Last question. In your experience, let's say last uh, four years, where, which non-development group have you seen be most willing, most ready uh, to take up this transformation or change or alteration to using Agile approaches? I would say over the last four years, it's been not so much outside of development, it's been the migration to different types of development other than software. Uh -huh. right? So these days I do a lot of work with companies that develop hardware uh, or firmware. And now historically these are groups that would look at you and say, yes, for software you're more flexible than we are, you're more we have, agile we than we are. We have constraints. Right, we're, yeah. you know, it takes real time and money to spin a new board and that's expensive both in terms of time and money. So no, we're not going to be agile in the same way you're going to be. And I actually have enjoyed working with those companies to help them see that there are various opportunities for them to be extremely agile. They do have a different cost to change curve. Right? That curve will sort of inflect up at a different point than it will for software. In software, we can tend to be embracing change until a later stage. If you're in the foundry manufacturing chips, 
that's not really the time you want to embrace a lot of change. It's too expensive in both time and money to do it. But they can be extremely agile up to certain points in time. And so what's important with them is finding out where the inflection point is on yeah, their change. Where's their curve. last responsible moment. Right. Exactly. Right. So that's what I've been seeing most over the past several years is that what was historically viewed as a software only approach, agile software development was even in the name, can now be more generalized to agile development where hardware, firmware, software, all of that can be in there. I mean, you look at organizations like Wikispeed that yeah. you know, put a car together every sprint yep. that is street legal, yeah. right? So I think that shows very clearly it is possible to do this. Now, once we handle development, it's at scale throughout the different types of development, I think this is where you'll start to see the other organizations within a given company come into play. And more and more are doing so. You know, some come willingly and others are less inclined to want to make the transition. And I'm not saying that to be fully agile, I'm just saying it would be nice if we had slightly better alignment than we do today. Sure. So if someone's not at Agile 2015 or the Mist Your Talk on Wednesday, how can they get in touch with you to have oh. more of this conversation? Perfect. Uh, so my company's called Inolution, uh, I-N-N-O-L-U-T-I-O-N.com. Uh, my website has, we'll have my presentation for this Wednesday, we'll be out on my website so people can download that. And I offer training and coaching in Agile. Uh, or you can, for a number of the topics we just discussed are actually covered in my book, uh, Essential Scrum. So uh, feel free to have a read on that. I've read your book. I like your book. Thank so you. I appreciate check that. Check it out. Thanks very much Michael, for spending time with us. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks a lot. Thank have you. Good luck in your talk.